Okay, so uh, we're, we're a little bit late starting, um, but that's always what happens when you uh, are trying to get many different people into the parliament. And I think everybody's here safe and sound. So we're going to get started, and I am not going to speak much, but I'm going to pass straight away to MEP uh, Manuela Ripa, and then on to Pascal Duran um, for the opening remarks, and then I'll explain a bit more about the event afterwards. Manuela. Thank you very much, um, and a warm welcome um, from my side to all panelists and all participants at today's event uh, on a need for a new white list, positive list, in order to end the suffering of animals and pet trade, especially for wildlife animals. This event, as just mentioned by Nick, is co-hosted by Pascal and me in association with the Animal Advocacy and Protection, AAP, and the Eurogroup for Animals. And it is clear, I would say, that it, we all share a passion for changing the way we behave towards animals to uh, better their lives and reduce the well-known risk to our health, environment, and biodiversity. So why is this event so timely? First of all, we are not only in the midst of a dramatic climate crisis, but also of a detrimental biodiversity crisis. The headless exploitation of nature by humans has led to unprecedented biodiversity loss and a worsening climate crisis. And wildlife trade, especially the illegal wildlife trade, is a driver of biodiversity loss and can vastly weaken wild populations of flora and fauna and in some cases drive them to extinction. Moreover, unmanaged wildlife trade can be a source of the spread of zoonotic diseases with devastating results for our public health as we just had to face with the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sure nobody of us wants to go back to that. So, by the way, the European Union is a hub for global wildlife trafficking and therefore has a key role to play in the fight against it. And as the reported seizure and trade values of wildlife trade in the EU are steadily rising, the Commission finally came up with a revised action plan against wildlife trafficking. We recent, recently debated this action plan in the Environment Committee, and the request for a positive list for wildlife trade was on the lips of many MEPs. And also, more and more member states are taking this extremely seriously, with new member states' positive lists being entrenched into law every year. We will hear about some member states like Cyprus and the Netherlands, as well as Belgium, later on. And we have a number of experts guests today to explore a variety of aspects to do with current EU pet trade, from the issue brought from the EU wild animal pet trade through to the solution in the form of a EU positive list. We are joined by David Van Genep, CEO of AAP, for a keynote speech. AAP a founding member of the European Alliance of Rescue Centers and Sanctuaries who experienced firsthand the dangers of pet trade. We will hear about the current scale of the pet trade from independent researchers and how difficult it is actually to get data on how many pets are being kept and traded in the European Union. We will also hear about a feasible, feasible legal basis for an EU positive list from an independent law firm. And importantly, we will hear about the added value of a new positive list and new investigations into the scale of pet trade and online trade. Let's just take my home country, Germany. There is a significant online trade in major live animal pet markets. In 2017, Provide Law found over 100,000 animals from over 2,000 species that were available on these online platforms. And the numbers certainly raised over the years. Since 2017, there have been on average over 6,000 annual sages involving CETAs listed wildlife in Europe. So this, the discussion today is particularly timely and important because the European Commission is now working on a study to assess the added value and feasibility of a EU positive list under their action plan. And an opinion poll in 2020 showed that almost 90% of interviewed EU citizens think that white animals should definitely not be kept as pets. The European Parliament agrees, and we reiterated twice in resolutions, and the last one was last year, the call for EU member states to establish a science-based 
EU-wide positive list of animals allowed as pets under appropriate welfare conditions without harms to population in the wild and the European diversity. And an EU-wide approach is of extreme importance as the lack of a common approach across the EU makes the true extent of trade flow difficult to monitor and the enforcement of existing rules almost impossible. And 19 member states made it clear that we need to investigate it, the added value of a new approach to a positive list of allowed pets. So let's make it happen. And I'm asking the commission, why shall we wait for it? This should be included this positive list should also be included in a new revision of animal welfare regulation, and the white paper launched today gives a legitimate route for that to happen. When I visited Europol in early January, it was clear that there is a link between the legal and the illegal trade. We need to severely tighten the rules across the EU on how we trade and keep pets, and I believe that a new positive list represents a simplified approach that adds value for enforcement organizations such as Europol. Now, I will hand over to Pascal, and I'm looking very much forward to this event today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Manuela. So uh, I do apologize. I, I have to go uh, to another meeting. It's, uh, I'm very sorry for that because it's a very, of course, important uh, topic. And, and, and uh, so, but uh, it's a life of a member of European Parliament. You know, you know what I mean. Okay. Uh, so as uh, uh, I, I, I read to read, I think it's better for you. And uh, and uh, so. I will uh, have heard from my colleague Manuela, there has been a big political support for an EU positive list within the Council and the Parliament. Uh, since 2016 in the European Parliament, we had no less than four resolutions supporting the idea of an EU positive list. The latest one, adopted in November uh, 2022, uh, specific specifically called for the Commission to carry out an impact assessment of the added value and feasibility of establishing such a list. We welcome the upcoming feasibility study announced by the Commission in the action plan against wildlife trafficking. But this action, this action plan must go beyond the current scope and include an assessment of all animals, including those bred in captivity. This is why we are here today to hear about the findings and recommendation of an important white paper, but put together by Eurogroup for Animals and AAP Animal Advocacy and Protection. Yeah. We are also here to have an open dialogue with member states, experts from Cyprus, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands to know more on how positive list legislation has been or is being developed in different countries. This can serve to share good practices to other member states thinking about adopting such lists. But it can also serve to feed the feasibility study directly. As my colleague Manuela explained, it is very surprising that some countries still allow exotic wild animals to be kept as pets for three main reasons. First, it's it is not good for the welfare of those animals, of course, as their owners often do not have the expertise to take care of them. Second, it's not good for our ecosystems, as those animals can become invasive species when abandoned or when they escape, uh, like the monk parakeet, uh, for instance, that we can see everywhere uh, nowadays in Brussels. And third, finally, it is not good for our common health. What animals come from everywhere and are found in terrible conditions, which heightens the risk of triggering a new epidemic like the one we have been facing those last three years. We have a mechanism to tackle these problems in a precautionary way by only allowing animals whose positive welfare can be easily accommodated in the household. Let's use it. The Commission is revising animal welfare legislation as we speak. It should take into account in its upcoming initiatives the welfare of wild animals traded as pets. I will now leave the floor to 
David von Kennep, Executive Director at Animal Advocacy and Protection. So organizations that wrote this white paper together with your real group for animals. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank and you. good conference, of course. Okay, so thank you very much uh, to our, our co-sponsors and MEPs. I'm going to pass straight on to David Van Gennep. And David, I think you're the best person to introduce yourself. Um, and we really can't wait to hear about your experiences. So looking forward to it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Pascal and Manuela, for uh, having this meeting. Um, let me start by saying how amazing it is to be here amongst so many good friends, but also to see the developments that this whole discussion about the positive list has gone through. If we would have organized this meeting 10 years ago, and I'm looking at Ilaria, who was in our midst in those days, but also Joe and others that we worked with closely, this would not have been possible a few years ago. So if I'm looking at evolution at this moment, I can only be very happy and very proud with what we achieved. I want to take you along through some examples that we encounter in our rescue center. But before doing so, can I have next slide? I would like to introduce myself very shortly. Um, next slide, please. So um, um, I'm a biologist uh, from origin, and um, uh, I was trained to be an immunologist and an eco, uh, ecotoxicologist. But I found the work with animal welfare far more interesting than the scientific work. So I joined uh, uh, several jobs first in the ministry, and later on I moved to AAP uh, uh, quite early in my career. So I'm part of the furniture, as they say. Uh, I've been here for uh, more than 30 years, so I've seen quite some developments uh, in, uh, in uh, this world. Um, nowadays, I'm uh, uh, a member of all kinds of boards. I'm also a proud member of the board of your group, which is for us very strong supportive to bring this issue to, uh, to the table, because without that kind of collaboration, we would not be here today. Um, further on, I'm a member of uh, an advisory council of the Dutch Minister of Agriculture uh, concerning animal welfare, which allows me also to be uh, involved in uh, many other aspects of animal welfare, which is very helpful to see also the interrelationship, like you're saying. I mean, there's more to it than just animal welfare. There's also the ecosystem and, uh, and, and, and public health that we have to address. Can I have the next slide? So... Just a few things about AAP. Um, uh, we are founded uh, officially in uh, 72, which makes us uh, 50 years old, which brings quite some experience, but also quite some data. And I want to stress that, that we are not only uh, uh, helping animals with their welfare, but we're also collecting data while doing so. Um, we have our main office in the Netherlands, Almere, but we also run a rescue center in uh, Spain, in Bijena, uh, where we ha also have about 100 animals. Um, Looking at size, they say size doesn't matter, but it does to some extent. Uh, we have about 120 uh, uh, people employed, 117 if I see it on this slide. That was the state of affairs, uh, the 1st of January of this year. But that also allows us to work on issues quite intensively. We can really focus on things, and there's three major focuses that we, uh, that we have, which is the positive list being one of them. Um, we are being supported by private people, so uh, that makes us quite independent. We can move around as we like. Um, well, that's what I would like to say about it. Can I have next slide? This is the realism that we are uh, facing every day. This is the statistics of the rescue requests that are being put on our doorsteps. The animals that we should rescue if we really wanted to do our work properly. Without, without really going in the exact, exact numbers, I mean, you can see where this, this is leading to. It's leading to an enormous number of animals where only a very small fraction can be rescued, where in the past we've just added up two years because otherwise the slide would become very uh, 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 jumpy. But if you would just look at the, the early days, like say, say 2000, 2001, it would be hundreds of animals and us taking in tens of animals. And nowadays, it's 10,000s of animals and still rescuing 50, 60, 100 animals and then reaching our capacity. This means that rescuing those animals alone will not bring the solution. And that's why we're here today, because we really have to put an end to this, because this graph will go on and on. It will grow. The numbers will grow and grow. 
And building new rescue centers is not the solution for this problem. Furthermore, by rescuing those animals, we can try to make the lives of those animals a little bit better, but still the suffering they went through and the killing that has been gone ahead of the rescue is really something we have to keep in mind. This really asks for a proactive, a proactive approach. We shouldn't wait for those animals to end up in private households. We should prevent them from being there. Can I have the next slide, please? Just some examples. I don't know if you know who this hero is, but this is a Gambian hamster rat. They are being used to detect mines in war zones, and they are very smart and intelligent animals, but they're also, they're also highly social animals. If you try to keep them as a pet, you can put them on a leash and you can walk them in the park, but they will never become a pet. So this small guy became quite aggressive. And if you then have a rat on your shoulder of two and a half kilos that, that suddenly attacks you, then it might be your best friend in finding mines, but he can also be quite unpleasant if he bites your ear off. Can I have the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. One of the uh, big challenges that we are encountering at the moment is the, uh, the wide range of small cats that are uh, being bought by all kinds of individuals. And this is an offer... The, the, the offer of these animals will, uh, 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 will, will bring customers so far that they buy these small kittens because they're being sold as kittens, but eventually the serval cat will become a fierceful cat. This one attacked its owner uh, in, a, in a very nasty way, the child of the owner in a very nasty way, and eventually was brought to our rescue center. Why should we wait until this happens? Let's try to prevent this in the first place. Can I have the next slide? Hard to see what happens here, but this was a private household in the Netherlands where a private keeper thought it would be nice to keep some degus, a small rodent species that lives in, the, in South America on very bare, air, a barren uh, 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 surface, eating as a herbivoric animal. Um, if you put them in a small cage, they start to multiply. And it's not, you don't, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to find out that eventually the uh, couple of uh, uh, degus will explode. And this pe these people had, I think, 115 uh, degus in their household. It was difficult to count them because these herbivoric animals had turned to become cannibalistic. They had eaten each other. Parts, limbs and parts of the animals were lying around in the, uh, in the aquaria they were, they were, where, where they were kept. So many of those animals we couldn't save and they had to be euthanized because there were only parts of them left. Why should we wait until this happens? Can I have the next slide, please? This is an example. Uh, I'm just showing you the, the X-ray because uh, um, uh, the, the whole animal we've already seen. This is a serval cat. Two of the, there are two of them being kept in Paris in a household where the owner found them a little bit to be uh, aggressive and locked them in uh, the bathroom to the, to the, uh, uh, to the pipes of the, the water uh, uh, system. But uh, the feeding of these animals was not, was not really sufficient. And you can see here the bones. Uh, these bones should be straight. But if you have a young serval cat, this was when uh, the cat was about one year old, and it's already looking like this. I mean, this is the worst form of arachidus that you could encounter. I mean, you would be, as a human being, you would be probably asking for euthanasia if this happens to you. But this, these animals keep living in these households until they die uh, uh, and from pain and agony. Why should we wait until this happens? Can I have the next slide, please? This is a small video that we uh, made for you just to show how a private person uh, comes across those animals and the kind of advice he or she gets uh, before he takes the animal in. Can you start the video, please? Ik ben hier nu in Zaandam en we gaan even op bezoek bij mensen die via Marktplaats een diertje gekocht hebben, een wasbeerhond. Maar ja, wasbeerhonden zijn geen huisdieren, dus de wasbeerhond werd een bijtertje. En nu moet hij naar Stichting Aap. Ik ben heel benieuwd hoe ze met dat dier omgaan. Hallo. Daar toch in Stichting Aap. Hoe lang hebben jullie beer nou al? Ik denk uh, ruim een jaar. En, en, en hoe kwam je nou op het idee om een, een wasbeerhond te gaan kopen? Want ja, dat is nou niet het meest alledaagse huisdier, hè? Nee, ja, je wil iets apart soms. Ik bedoel, je ziet zo'n klein beestje op een gegeven moment op internet en uh, dan denk je van ja, leuk. Vanaf welk moment had je nou het gevoel van hé, hey, dit wordt minder leuk? Ja, sinds een, sinds een paar maanden eigenlijk. Ik denk dat hij volwassen wordt. Oh. En dat hij zegt van dit is mijn terrein en uh, alles wat 
ik niet accepteer op dat moment, dan uh, grijp ik je. De dochter van Yvonne heb je al een keer gebeten, maar heb je al meerdere malen gebeten. Dan gaat hij de bijzen maar afvallen. En toen werd je het in één keer duidelijk van dit gaat niet. Ja, dat kan gewoon niet. Maar ja. Hé, hey, hou op. Nee. Van de week geweest allemaal. Dat is van deze week? Ja, dit is van de eergisteren en dat is van vorige week. Maar het loopt dus wel gewoon uit de hand uiteindelijk. Ja. 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 En dat is ook de reden dat jullie hier staan. So here you see a, a person who's really fond of animals. It's not like he wants to torture animals. He's fond of animals. He saw an animal online. The, the pet store uh, owner told him that he could raise the animal just as a dog without telling him that raccoon dogs are non-social animals. Using the mechanisms that work with a social animal like a dog will definitely not work. But also, they're not domesticated. They cannot be trained the same way as a dog can be trained. So that's how these animals end up in, uh, in private households. Now, since last week, we know that probably the raccoon dogs were responsible for the spreading of COVID-19. I mean, I'm not saying that uh, uh, this private owner has spread COVID-19 over, uh, over the rest of the world, but it could be that the Chinese are not responsible for it, but it could be that a private owner like him uh, has been responsible for uh, such a thing. I think we shouldn't wait for things like this to happen. Why do we wait until trouble comes upon these animals and the people buying them? Can I have the next slide, please? So, what's next? Well, first of all, I'm a happy person because after 31 years of struggle, finally the Netherlands will implement the positive list January 2024. So the law was there in 1991 and the positive list is there in 2024. It has taken a while, but it did happen eventually. And it is not because uh, the, the Dutch government was lazy, but because there were so many opposition to the legislation that we proposed. In order to prevent this from happening, we are now, with the help of the National Postcode Lottery, we are developing, developing a systematics. It's not under instruction, like it says here, it's under construction. Um, so we are developing a methodology that will help member states by uh, uh, setting up a, a positive list once the legal requirements have been set. Because if every country by itself should do, go through the same misery as we did in the Netherlands, we are not reusing our time in an efficient way. And finally, there are several countries in Europe that already do have a positive list in the legislation, and we're going to help them to find the best way to implement this positive list. So that's the next step. Can I have the last slide, please? And here you can see the status of affairs in Europe. We had to adjust this slide rapidly because last week, just last week, the Spanish government decided, or the Spanish parliament decided to adopt a new animal welfare law with a positive list included. So where Spain was in this map yellow in uh, uh, last week, we had to color it green uh, since, uh, since exactly a week ago. And we are very proud of that success because our Spanish team has worked on this quite hard and it uh, uh, eventually led to the, to the success that we can now celebrate. This animal welfare law also so has some, some problems still. I mean, not everything has been solved in there, but at least some issues have been solved. As you can see here, there are still quite some countries that do not have a positive list yet and that do not have a legislation yet. Suppose that we would have to cover all these uh, countries. There are 16 left in the EU that do not have a positive list. Suppose that it would take 31 years in all of those countries to work on a positive list. That would bring us to about 450 years of work until that happens. Let's please not go that route. Let's make sure that the EU covers this problem once and for all, not only for one member state, but for all member states together. And um, I've worked on this issue for 31 uh, years now. I'm 61 now, so I will not be able to cover more than one other country in my lifetime. So I hope that we will see realism here and that we can see that this is something where the EU has, taken its, has to take its responsibility instead of individual member states. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the next speaker. Okay, thank you so much, uh, David. That's really inspiring, absolutely fantastic. And with, uh, with real experiences from what's actually happening within these rescue centers. Um, <clears throat> so before we move on to the next section, we're gonna have uh, two more main sections of this event. 
First of all, we are going to, uh, to launch this beautiful white paper that we are very, very proud of. Um, and so I'm going to be uh, uh, introducing this first next, and then we'll speak to uh, da Davida Rigioni and uh, Alessandra Frattini after that, who uh, have had fundamental parts to play within this. And um, after that, we're going to introduce our fantastic panel, one of which is online, but I'll go into the full introductions uh, in the second section. Um, so if we could have the next slide, please. Oh, well, this is me. <laughs> uh, I have to remember my own name now. Uh, it says Nicholas Clark there, but I prefer Nick. I always feel like I'm in trouble when I'm being called Nicholas. Um, but when you have a look at this picture here and think to yourselves, what kind of words come to your, come to your mind when you see this animal? And to me, the main words are freedom, choice. This animal has a choice to implement its, its wild instincts, you know? Now, this is a bearded dragon. It's a solitary animal. It should not be placed with um, other members of its species. Uh, next slide. But what about these bearded dragons here? These are found in a, in a, a live animal pet market uh, in the Netherlands, uh, thanks to our member World Animal Protection. And they do not have the choice or the freedom to behave in their natural way, to implement their natural instincts. Next slide, please. The bull python. Naturally, it needs to extend its whole body length. Next slide. But how about this bull python? How long is it spending inside this tiny container? Uh, again, in a pet market. It has to travel there, likely in this container. And we don't know the home that it's going to. And we don't know if the people that it's going to well equipped enough to actually allow this animal uh, to fulfill its natural instincts. Next slide, please. Beautiful tree porcupine. Expert climbers, when, they're, when they need to, when they want to, they have the freedom to climb a tree to escape. Next slide. Not this tree porcupine. And what happens when we have wild animals in the home that are allowed to uh, use their natural instincts? Next slide, please. Well, we can have severe problems for our beloved companion animals, but also ourselves as well. This is a real, real problem. Next slide, please. So I promise you that you will be shocked by the variety of the number of species that we can actually keep legally in the EU. As uh, David said, every country is different. And I have a confession to make. The, de the map that's in this book is already out of date, just like David said. So uh, things are changing very quickly for the better. I'm also going to introduce, and this white paper introduces a system that not only adds value to the uh, negative parts that come from uh, the pet trade within the EU, but also adds value, uh, if we can click, it also adds value to the existing legal framework because it helps us to better implement and enforce the existing legal framework. And we're going to demonstrate a legally feasible option for a positive list later. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we're talking about the, uh, the vast uh, variety of animals that we see. Uh, next slide. And all of the animals that you can see here were actually found in a very short investigation that Davida will, uh, will mention later on. Online, uh, these animals are available to be bought and kept as pets in the EU. And we often think about status symbols, you know, uh, very often on social media, you have people that pose with powerful animals because maybe it makes them feel powerful or people pose with exotic creatures because it might help them feel exotic. And we have a cuteness factor. I mean, I'm guilty of this too. I, I, I go through social media, I see a beautiful animal and I just, my first thought is like, oh, that's just lovely. And then I have to really take a step back and think, hang on, wouldn't this be far more lovely in its natural habitat, in its natural environment? Um, I mean, my, my friend owned a sugar glider and he used to talk to me about how much the sugar glider loved him because it would jump from the cage and fly down and, uh, and land on his arm. But he also forgot about the 98% uh, of the time that this Poor animal spent in a cage by itself, especially when uh, my friend was at work. And even uh, I was a teacher for, for several years, 
10 years, actually. I'm not giving away my age. But um, I used to, uh, to, to inspire my students. I used to show them pictures of wild animals, of course, because I was a biology teacher. And now upon reflection, I, I look back at my days as a, as a teacher and I think, wow, if we were looking at wild animals being kept as pets at home, what lesson was I really teaching these students? I was teaching them a lesson of human domination over nature. But what this positive list really demonstrates is a way forward to change from a system of domination over nature to one more aligned with stewardship and respect for nature. And that's extremely important. Next slide, please. And the next one as well. Now, this is an image of a sugar glider. And unfortunately, sugar gliders are often kept alone, but they are social creatures. And um, they get so bored that they will eventually end up self-mutilating. This is just one of myriad examples of welfare harms that we demonstrate in this white paper of all kinds of different species that are not suitable to be kept as pets in the home. Next slide, please. In the white paper, you'll find uh, the health and safety issues um, with wild, keeping wild animals in the home. As we heard from, uh, from David, we have new evidence that actually uh, COVID-19 likely came from a uh, raccoon dog. Well, we saw people keeping raccoon dogs in the home. Uh, now they're on the invasive alien species list, but, uh, but still there's plenty of other wildlife that still can pose potential health and safety dangers. Next slide. The uh, guidance from the Convention on Biological Diversity demonstrates the pet trade as a significant uh, invasive alien species pathway. Uh, we, we heard from uh, Pascal earlier that the monk parakeet is a, a great example of that. This is a monk parakeet. I saw a per pandemonium of parakeets. That's the brilliant word for a group of parrots. Um, outside my house just a couple of days ago. And I think to myself, wow, these are beautiful animals. But why are they here? Next slide, please. And conservation issues. I was lucky enough to be in Panama. Uh, CITES. Uh, this is the uh, alligator snapping turtle, wonderful animal, but one of the 249, 48 animals that was uh, actually increased their protection status as a direct result of the, of the pet trade. You know, this demonstrates just how important this is. And I'm sorry, but 249 species isn't enough. We have thousands of species that are currently in the pet trade. Next slide, please. So this white paper, I'm going to have to hold and juggle a few different things here now. This white paper represents a signpost, a roadmap, if you will, for uh, many different papers that have been produced in the past by Eurogroup for Animals app and our members, um, and ones that have been developed for this white paper, and also our proposals for the future. Next slide, uh, next clip. So you can see they're actually over there if you want to see them afterwards. I can't even hold them all here because there's so many. These are, many of these are novel papers that have been developed just for this white paper. So there's a lot of information here. I really encourage people to read it. Next slide. Um, I will move on to the next slide because I want to save some time. So we also go into the idea of internal market distortions, which is very important. As we saw from uh, David's map, and we're going to see from my map in a second, there are huge differences in the legislation in different member states. Now, what this paper does is it shows you evidence of the initial problem. We have a single market, but we have different laws for certain goods within different countries. How can that be in a single market? This causes disruption in the single market, and harmonized law is the way to reduce that um, disruption. Next slide, please. Uh, so here, this is a slightly different map to the one David showed, because David is more up to date than mine. Um, and, uh, of course, we, we have the amazing news that Spain have adopted uh, the positive list. So the next stage is to develop it now, how to do that. Um, but we have this mosaic of national laws, which actually affects the different imports that different countries can have. And so we really need a harmonization of the market. And that can be based on a positive list based on animal welfare. We'll go into details about that later. Next slide. I promised you that uh, we would show you a system that can actually add value to the current legal framework. Well, here we have a representation of the different laws 
uh, at EU level that touch upon animals that might be kept in the home. And currently, let's take the, the animal health law, an extremely well-written law, comprehensive. But if you have a huge variety of different species that are traded, if you have a huge number of species, different countries have different laws, it's extremely difficult to understand if a commercial movement has actually happened or not. It's very hard to actually keep up with this trade. And uh, the current legal framework, while well, written in a way that it could do this, in order to implement it, it is next to impossible. So what a positive list does is it reduces the number of animals that are in the pet trade and simply makes all of these well-written laws more implementable and more enforceable. Next slide, please. Now we heard about the um, we heard about the feasibility study that's coming up. Really, it's a study on the added value and feasibility of an EU-wide positive list. Now here, because of uh, the way that a positive list can work, if we we have several different things about to come up. So if we could click them, a positive list has added value for enforcement because a simplified measure is obviously going to be easier to know what's legal and what is illegal, and therefore easier to enforce. We have health, invasive alien species, and conservation. Well, of course, a lower number of um, species traded is going to have massive added value for all of these areas. The online trade, where we have illegal adverts, as Davida will show you later, um, so many adverts, you can, you can get a, mass super, uh, so a marmoset from Poland, where it's legal to have it, but you can get it shipped to Italy, where it's illegal to have it. I mean, this is just the argument for subsidiarity right there. You know, you, you cannot have member states doing this by themselves. So um, what's missing is animal welfare legislation with regard to animals kept as pets. And what can fill that gap is the positive list. Next slide, please. Um, I won't go into detail here because it's been said by our co-hosts really well, um, but we have an action plan against wildlife trafficking. I really thank the Commission for being here to listen to our message, so thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for including the positive list in the action plan against wildlife trafficking. It was a real sense that uh, civil society was being listened to in the stakeholder consultations, and I must stress that that is a, a fantastic thing. But here, the Council and the Parliament have asked for um, the assessment of this positive list to go beyond just species taken from the wild to include captive bred animals as well. All of the problems that I mentioned before, they're also there for animals that are bred in captivity, not just those that are taken from the wild. Next slide, please. So three calls from today as a whole, okay? With this feasibility study, we really hope that it goes beyond um, the current scope, as I mentioned. We're going to demonstrate a legal basis that is a feasible way forward to go at EU level. And we really hope that any analysis and any study really incorporates that model as well. Because we really feel that it will be a feasible way with significant added value. And finally, we heard uh, in the introductory remarks about the new animal welfare legislation. Now, this is really important. This is the chance. Uh, wild animals have never had their welfare looked after. But these are going to be, we're talking about wild animals that people are keeping at home. They're selling them, they're trading them, they're gifting them. They are being kept at home. So why are we not including this in upcoming animal welfare legislation? It just does not make sense. And there is a way forward, and we can show you how through this white paper. So that is enough from me. Um, I'm going to pass on to, uh, to Davida uh, first, and then on to Alessandra. Um, so please, David, I'd I'm going to let you introduce yourself because you'll do it so much better than me. Yeah. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Um, and thanks for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here in these uh, important events. Um, so my, I'm, my name is David Ergoni. I'm the founder of uh, and managing director of Sapiens. And the reason I'm here today is to report on, uh, on the research we conducted for Eurogroup for Animals and App um, on the situation of the exotic uh, pets in the uh, European Union. Uh, can, you, can you click the next slide, please? Um, again. Yeah. 
So the, 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 the research we conducted was not designed to provide uh, a full and complete overview of the uh, European situation, but rather to uh, provide early insights, so to speak, and, um, and a, a likely snapshot of the current situation uh, regarding exotic uh, animals in the Europe, European Union. So we mainly had well, we had three main questions, three main research questions. We wanted to uh, be able to estimate how many uh, exotic pets there are in the European Union, what is their level of uh, welfare, and where is more research needed uh, in this topic. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So to address these uh, research questions, we used uh, uh, we combined very different uh, research methodologies. We conducted desk research. Uh, we conducted uh, interviews with different stakeholders, including veterinarians working um, and, and specialized with exotic pets or exotic animals in general. But we also used more innovative uh, research approaches to penetrate uh, markets that are much more difficult to penetrate. Uh, and, and I'm talking about the online trade. So what we did was we created essentially a, a, a mystery online profile where we I became another person essentially uh, from different nationalities, um, and we we uh, access these uh, the dedicated platforms where you can buy and sell uh, exotic animals, um, and pretended to be interested in buying in buying uh, so those animals. And we will see what this uh, part of the research um, delivered in terms of uh, new information. Can you go to the next slides, please? And click uh, twi twice or yeah yeah perfect. Um, so to answer one of the first uh, the first research question, so how many exotic pets are there in the European Union? We have to say that the, uh, the there were not a lot of available data in the selected countries. Um, however, we did find some partial partial data from uh, France and Italy. Overall, uh, uh, when we looked at the the official reports from the Borough Post, that are uh, designated to inspect for the imports of live animals, um, we did find that the, the the order of magnitude of the presence and uh, of uh, exotic animals in the European Union Union is in the order of millions rather than thousands. Mm -hmm. So, just to give an example, in uh, in Italy between the, uh, 2019 and 2021, uh, one million reptiles, 2.5 million ornamental fish, and more than 50,000 exotic mammals were imported into the country. Uh, it should be also be noted that this is likely to be a gross underestimation of the actual presence of these animals, as uh, these numbers only refer to the to the imports into the European into the country uh, or into the European Union, um, but they do not account for or they do not reflect the intra European Union trade. Uh, as we will see later, the there is reasons to believe and there is evidence that a big portion of the uh, intra-EU trade goes basically untraced and not unnotified. Uh, the next slides, please. Um, so we were also looking for another, let's say, indirect parameter of the magnitude of the presence of exotic pets in the European Union. Um, and, uh, and we asked, basically, we thought to ask to the veterinarians working with exotic pets uh, about the number of visits they will do uh, per year with these, uh, with these animals. And the numbers show that, uh, again, the, 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 the very consistent figures, uh, just to give an example, a specialized uh, clinic, so a clinic, a veterinary clinic that is specialized in treating and, and providing health services to exotic animals, conducts up to 12,000, more than 12,000 uh, visits per year uh, to these kind of animals. While a, 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 a do veterinary doctor working uh, independently can visit uh, can conduct up to 1500 visits per year with these animals um, and these data were consistent uh, for the three countries we, we we selected so Ireland France and Italy um, of course to have a full view of the scale of the phenomenon we should also know how many uh, veterinary doctors work actually or are, are specialized with these animals and uh, again, we had some data from Italy uh, where we, we know that there are at least uh, a bit more than 800 veterinary doctors specialized in exotic pets. Um, so that's, that's, uh, it's relatively easy to make some calculations, again, taking into consideration that these are likely to be a gross underestimation uh, because it's based on an indirect uh, index and it's based on the fact that um, uh, it doesn't include the, the visits to uh, veterinary doctors that are not specialized in exotic pets, which were not included in this research. The next slide, please. 
Uh, it is also interesting to note that the number of specialists, uh, so veterinary, veterinarians that are specialized in exotic pets, seems to be increasing, or actually there is evidence that it is increasing. Uh, compared to 2008, in 2016, there, were, there was an increase of 400% in the, in the number of uh, veterinarians choosing uh, uh, to specialize in, a treatment, in the treatment uh, of exotic animals. Uh, next slide, please. Um, when interviewing the veterinarians, we also had information not only on the size of the of the phenomenon, but also on the quality of the uh, or the perceived quality of the husbandry. So we asked veterinarians, "How do you see? Uh, what is your per your perception of the quality of the husbandry of the uh, of the owners of exotic pets?" Uh, and we had three main findings. You can, can you click three times? Um, uh, we had three main findings. First of all, the quality of the husbandry is perceived as very uh, inconsistent, meaning that there are indeed some uh, pet owners that are extremely skilled and extremely knowledgeable about the animals, but there is also a big portion of uh, uh, pet owners who have literally no idea of what they're doing. And this uh, leads, of course, to bad, bad uh, quality of the husbandry, which is, according to the veterinarians, li uh, linked to most of the pathologies that are observed uh, in their practice. Uh, so mm -hmm. up to 90% of the symptoms or the pathologies that are uh, shown uh, by the animals uh, that are treated by the veterinarians are linked to basically bad animal management. Uh, the interviews also reveal that actually normally most of the times, and that's a bit uh, confirmed by the, what was said before, is not a bad intention, it's not that are, the pet owners are bad people or that are, they are cruel. It's just that the major, uh, they have very poor to no knowledge of how to treat these animals, uh, especially with more complex animals, some, some species of reptiles. Uh, they, they look cute, they look uh, very uh, um, fascinating, but they're very difficult to treat. And most of, many pet owners do not have the skills and, or the knowledge to, to provide a, a, a appropriate uh, a management. Next slide, slide please. Yeah, the the um, in terms of the on, the the quality the, the the animal welfare was also uh, we had in, in information about the animal welfare of the exotic pets also from the research on the online trade, which uh, overall shows very low level of concern by the sellers. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so the for instance, when we are trying to negotiate or and, and trying to buy some animals. Uh, we, we realized, it was revealed by the interviews that um, the sellers were really not, uh, not providing uh, appropriate guidelines on how to transport or, or keep these animals. For instance, we were told that when I was trying to buy a Corsac fox that the animal was very tough and that could uh, be transported for 24 hours with no problem. Or to, keep, uh, to take a plastic box for, for a cat uh, if I wanted to transport a big bird from Germany to, to Belgium. Next slide, please. And this was also true for other basic needs of the animal, like uh, nutrition, uh, um, uh, sleeping, um, uh, 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 social needs, and so on. So the, the guidelines were extremely vague and, and generic and not species specific. You go to the next slide. Um, so in addition to a low level of concern shown by the sellers, we also had, we show uh, we, the, 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 inter, the research with the, in the online trade showed that there is an easy access to illegal trade. And that the trade is uh, can be very easily untracked. So uh, there, it can happen without no notification whatsoever to the competent authorities. The next slide, to provide some more, more details about, about this. Um, uh, we tried to buy animals with an identity from Belgium and, and Italy, where there was some already some positive list uh, uh, adopted. And we tried to buy animals that were banned in, a, in the country of the buyers, so in Belgium and Italy. And that was ex never actually a problem. Uh, we out, out of the 18 interviews, we could buy uh, um, 17 out of the 18 interviews. It was they could lead to a, to, to the purchase of a very strange animals like uh, or very uh, 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 yeah very wild animals like uh, uh, bear cats, corsac foxes, a golden eagle, um, porcupines, and uh, and caracal cats and so on. So I have a long list. And, and so, and none, none of the sellers uh, actually uh, mentioned the necessity to um, notify the competent authorities. So suggesting that actually uh, a, a big portion or, or at least one portion of the trade goes untracked. Uh, next slide, please, to conclude. So to, uh, 
to there are three main conclusions that we can um, from, from this research. First of all, when we talk about the size, it is difficult to, find, to, to have an accurate estimate, but we are relatively confident uh, and quite confident that we are talking about millions of exotic pets in the European Union. Um, and this is, uh, for the reason I said before, is a gross underestimation. The quality of the husbandry is uh, inconsistent and it's linked to the, uh, clearly linked to the animal health, so to, to animal welfare. And it's perceived to be quite low in the online trade. And in terms of knowledge gaps, uh, there are uh, a lack of uh, or, 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 or scarcity of official data concerning the movements, both intra and extra EU. And uh, there is a, a basically a blind spot in terms of uh, one ownership of how many people are keeping exotic uh, animals and their level of welfare. Thanks a lot uh, for the, again, for listening. And um, yeah, see you later. <laughs> Fantastic, Davida, thank you so much. Um, really amazing insights. And so now we have a, a, an idea of the kind of research that was done. I've introduced the white paper and I told you that there is a feasible way forward. So I'm going to in introduce um, Alessandra Frattini. Uh, she's partner, uh, founding partner of um, Frattini uh, Bergano, European Lawyers. And uh, I pass the floor straight to you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for having me here. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being ready to listen to this specific uh, presentation. My team and I were asked by uh, Eurogroup for Animals to examine whether and how the EU could adopt a positive list. That is to say, a measure whereby only um, uh, species that are listed in the list could be traded in the EU. So I'll try now to um, present the results of this uh, assessment uh, in a very succinct, uh, succinct way. Next slide, please. I will do so by looking first at the content and the aims that the measure establishing a positive uh, list is intended to attain. Then look at the, um, go back to the, to the uh, summary, please. To the potentially feasible legal basis, that means uh, the uh, potentially relevant uh, provisions of the treaty that are um, relevant, as I said, for the attainment of those uh, aims. I will look at compatibility with the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality, the legal instrument that could be adopted, and then I will briefly touch upon uh, the issue of compliance with WTO. As I said, I'll start with content and aims of the measures. Next slide, please. Um, and I will do so because under the principle of conferral, under the Article 5 of the treaty, the EU can only act within the limits of the competences that have been conferred to it by the member states. So there has to be at least one provision in the treaty that allows the EU to act in that specific field. And the Court of Justice re re recalled that the choice of the legal basis is to be determined in light of objective factors, and in particular, the aim and the content of a measure. Next slide, please. So the measure we're talking about would have as a content the establishment of a positive list, allowing the trade of the listed companion animals within the EU. And in this context, trade, the term trade would mean, and consistently with the definition that is used in the basic regulation, Council, uh, Council regulation, the introduction into the union and the export and re-export therefrom, as well as the use, movement and transfer of possession within the EU, including within a member state, of companion animals, subject to the provision, of course, of the measure establishing the EU positive list. And the term companion animals, and here again, consistently with um, uh, the definition that we have in the animal health law uh, would mean animals that are traded for the purpose of human companionship and or leisure or for being kept in a household. As to the aims, next slide uh, please, uh, the measure would aim at protecting animal welfare in the first place, but most predominantly it would aim at improving the conditions for the establishment and functioning of the internal market for companion animals, and in particular, by addressing the fragmentation that results from the different national provisions. We have heard from the presentation earlier on that we have a mosaic of uh, uh, provision across the EU. Next slide, please. So these being the objectives, the potentially feasible legal basis, that is to say, the, the relevant uh, treaty provisions are, next slide please, 
Article 113 and Article 114 of the uh, treaty. The first one refers to animal welfare. Well, that one is not uh, really a legal basis uh, suitable for establishing an EU positive list because basically Article 13 is an, more of an horizontal principle that applies across the board. Um, when the EU adopts measures in the policy fields that are listed um, therein. Uh, nevertheless, animal welfare requirements are to be fully taken into account in formulating the measure. While uh, um, Article 114 concerning internal market, uh, um, according to established case law, can be relied upon as a legal basis if three conditions are met. First, there must be an internal market barrier resulting from disparities in the laws, administrative provisions, or regulations of the member states, and we know that that is the case. Second, that internal market barrier creates obstacles to cross-border trade, which is by definition, of course. And third, the measure, the intended measure, must remove the obstacle to cross-border trade. So uh, we came to the conclusion these three conditions are met with regard to a measure establishing a positive list. Next slide, please. Then, because the um, internal market is a competence that is not exclusive to the EU, but is a shared competence with member states, we need to look also at the uh, compliance of the choice of this legal basis with the principle of subsidiarity and proportionality. I look first at the subsidiarity principle laid down in Article 5, Paragraph 3 of the Treaty of the EU, that basically requires that the proposed action can, because of its scale and effects, be better achieved at the level of the EU. Now, here it's in, 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 the, in the essence of the measure that we are uh, looking at. So a measure that effectively contributes to the functioning of the EU internal market by harmonizing national provisions, by definition, pursues an objective that cannot be adequately pursued by member states alone. So a measure that establish, establishes a positive list under Article 114 of the treaty would comply with the subsidiarity principle. Moving then to the proportionality principle, next slide, please, which is uh, paragraph four of the same article five of the treaty. The principle requires that a measure is appropriate for attaining its legitimate objective, does not go beyond what is necessary to achieve those objectives, and does not cause disadvantages which are disproportionate to the objective pursued. This last one is the so-called the proportionality stricto sensu test. Now, if we look at, the, um, at these three conditions in connection with the positive list, next slide, pre, uh, please, we can see that a measure establishing such a positive list would be first suitable because it would apply across the EU and therefore would remove the existing divergences at national level. It would be necessary because uh, a, far, a less far-reaching measure not only, for example, the establishment of rescue centers, as we heard earlier from David, but also the establishment of a negative list, would not have an equal preventive effect. And on top of it, it would also become outdated fast because of the developments in the supply of new animal species on the market. And third, when it comes to the proportionate, uh, proportionality strict to sensor test, uh, if, you, if we think of the disadvantages in terms of, uh, for example, effects on the freedom uh, to pursue an economic activity of economic operators that are already in the market, as the positive list would not be a blanket ban, well, it would not constitute a disproportionate impairment on the rights to exercise an economic activities or of the right to property in that respect. And it's worth mentioning at this stage that the Court of Justice, in a case uh, uh, concerning a positive list for vitamins and uh, minerals, had the opportunity to confirm that a positive list would not be manifestly disproportionate if it provided for an application procedure designed to um, allow a given, for what matters here, animal species, to be added to or removed from that list. So a sort of flexibility that would allow, in case of development of uh, science, for example, or, or other assessment, to uh, adjust that list. And also, in the respect, the existence of certification schemes for keeper, keepers and breeders would allow to uh, pass the proportionality stricto sensu test. Next slide, please. 
Now, if you look at what legal instrument would be appropriate for uh, such a measure, um, next slide, please. It seems that a regulation would ensure a uniform identification of companion animals that could be traded within the EU, and in that respect, enable a consistent and effective applications of the rules. So a regulation appears to be necessary to provide legal certainty and transparency for both economic operators and consumers. And also it will be consistent with the existing policy framework in the field of, uh, field of animal welfare that is mostly composed of uh, regulations. And then a final note on um, WTO compliance uh, issues. Next slide, please. It's clear that uh, a fully fledged analysis or scrutiny under uh, WTO can only be uh, carried out once you have an actual measure on the table, so what is actually in the measure. However, based on the scope and the objectives of the measures, which in turn identify the WTO agreements against which the compliance assessment has to be uh, carried out, while well, a positive list based on the objectives that we have assessed could be developed in compliance with WTO rules. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Can we have a round of applause for the... Um, so I think we've seen quite comprehensively uh, a, a list of the, the problems with the pet trade, um, what's happening with the scale of the pet trade, the insights of uh, vets, the insights of the online trade, um, and then a real feasible way forward, which is proportional, adheres to the principles of subsidiarity um, and really is a, a, a decent way forward. And we believe that that's the way we should go. Um, we also heard the idea that it's not a blanket ban. And I think that is really, really important for everybody to understand because a positive list can be misunderstood and misconstrued. But really, it's quite a sensible, practical approach. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to move on to the second section of, uh, of today's uh, speeches. And um, this is a panel, and I'm going to introduce Reinecke Hamelis, the CEO of Eurogroup for Animals. So I'm sitting next to my boss, so uh, please uh, say nice things and smile. And so please, Reinecke, the floor is yours, and to introduce this really fantastic panel. Thanks so much, uh, Nick. And firstly, thank you, Manuela, for hosting this important uh, event uh, uh, today. Um, we are now going to hear from several experts um, from countries who have already implemented uh, or are in the process of introducing uh, positive lists. Um, and really hear from them, uh, why have they introduced uh, a positive list? Uh, what were the challenges? How did they overcome them? Um, and how do they think uh, that their experiences can really inform uh, the feasibility study the Commission will be uh, undertaking? I hope you're not too hungry yet. I see there are some sandwiches, but please bear with us. We will try uh, to really finish uh, around uh, one, uh, but not without having listened to uh, our experts. Um, and um, once we have done some introductions, um, I'm opening uh, the floor. So I would really like you all to ask your questions. So we have um, a, a very um, animated debate uh, about this. Um, so on my right, I would like to introduce uh, Laure uh, de Comer, uh, Animal Welfare Policy at the Flemish uh, Government uh, at the Department of Animal Welfare. And then uh, Marina uh, Michaelidou, uh, Senior Officer um, of the Cyprus Agriculture, Natural Resources and Environment Ministry. And then uh, Berit uh, Marjares, who is online. I hope you can hear us well, um, uh, Berit. Um, she's Veterinary Inspector at the Luxembourg Veterinary and Food Administration. And then uh, Sabine van Mesten, uh, Animal Welfare Senior Policy Officer at the Dutch Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality. Uh, so warm welcome to all of you. Um, I would like to ask you all to uh, introduce um, yourself and really um, explain to us, us why did your country decide to introduce a, a positive list and move away from the negative list um, uh, approach? And if applicable, because some of you are still in the process of introducing a positive list, how did you evaluate its success? And of course, we are also very curious to hear this from Belgium, uh, because this is the positive list that has been in place uh, the longest. Um, we should also note that at the moment, seven member states 
have introduced or will introduce a positive list and that uh, Finland and uh, probably also Portugal um, are seriously considering uh, this. So we see a lot of traction already. So firstly, inviting you, uh, Laura, to come in and uh, to share about what is happening uh, in Belgium. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Laura, I work for the um, Flemish government, Department of Animal Welfare. And I would first like to highlight actually our positive list history. So um, the thought process around the positive list actually started for us um, in the 90s. So that's actually quite a while ago for me. <laughs> um, our first royal degree um, was created in 2001 and was later also annulled after a process at the Council of States um, because there were complaints from private owners, from um, associations, hobbyists. Um, but in 2009, a new royal degree was created, um, fixing a list of 42 mammal species um, that everyone could keep. Um, and our list was actually created um, with the, pro, uh, the precautionary principle in mind. So you can keep an animal unless you can, um, com it's compatible with its welfare. So measuring the success of a positive list is, is quite hard um, because it mostly aims at a um, change of mentality. So you can actually measure that after years. So that's really difficult. Um, a direct consequence we saw was that prohibited animals disappeared from pet shops. And most importantly, people didn't consider it normal anymore to keep exotic pets, to trade exotic pets. So it's actually that change. 